Hi there, it's uh, Ricky from Marshall Times once again. I'm delighted to welcome Maltese deathcore metal band, um, Hain. Uh, we have Chris, vocalist. We've also got Claud Claudio, the bassist, and we've got Jack, the guitarist. So how are you doing, guys? How have you been since lockdown? Have you been lucky enough to keep your jobs and everything like that, or has it been quite tough in Malta? Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll start like this. <laughs> yeah, so... Well, lockdown in Malta was practically neg negligible. Beginning of the year, we had like two or three months where it was a semi-lockdown and yeah. people were urged to stay inside and many people did. Uh, but then the economy was hit quite hard. So, uh, you know, the government decided we should open the, the economy again. Get now the ball rolling. Get the ball rolling. But now cases are skyrocketing again, at least for Malta. But we were all lucky to keep our jobs. Good. Uh, almost. Um, almost. I didn't. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but Jack is still studying at university, so that that's okay. He has he has something to do anyway. <laughs> that's excellent. Yeah, in Scotland, it's just um, just yesterday actually we are down in my lockdown again. You know, so it's pretty much you can go to a shop and that's it. You know, to get some food and that's it. You know, it's just wish it would hurry up and end. But anyway, um, so the reason for the interview is obviously to talk about Hain. So Hain have only been active for a couple of years and so far you've released four singles. So have I been hearing rumours then that Hain are about to release their debut EP? Yes, actually the EP will be coming about in early December. Um, uh, so we've worked on a five-track EP. Five. Started on it in the beginning of the year. Um, uh, then even since you asked about lockdown as well, we were interrupted halfway through the recording. Yeah. Um, uh, we were recording at Spine Spitter Studios in Malta. Um, uh, and yes, so now uh, once lockdown was paused again, uh, um, uh, we went in to keep on recording the rest of the stuff. Yeah. Chris had his job to do as well after, <laughs> afterwards. Yeah. Um, but yeah, now finally, finally, it's all finalized. Release date is almost upon us, um, and we're soon there. Yeah, you must all be excited. It's only a couple of weeks away, so you must all be excited to get it out for everybody to hear. Um, so see the four singles that you've released then. Are any of those songs going to be on the EP? No, no. The, no. Only the last single we released, uh, "Burn It Down," that's going to be on the EP. The other four singles, you could call them, yeah, they were actually just singles because um, it was more like an introduction. Yeah. Let's put it like that. They weren't in a formalized EP yeah. format, or something like that. so we were just testing the waters at the time because that core for Malta as a style is relatively new, I would say. Yeah? yeah, I mean, I think we are the only band at the moment doing something on those lines so we were kind of seeing how the people how the crowd would you know, react, react yeah. and then yeah and we got good reception so that gave us the motivation to actually do an ep and and we're actually all already working on new stuff for the next well <laughs> I'll, next come to that. I'll come to that then so <laughs> The singles then, were you also trying to like develop your sound, try to hone your down to the sound that you wanted? And do you think you found the sound that you wanted with EP? Yes, I think like um, Chris was saying, the first four singles were more us experimenting on what lines we would want our sound to develop. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in that way, same as he was saying, the reception was quite good the way the songs got received. Um, even there was then a lineup change. Our back then original guitarist, uh, he left the band, and eventually we replaced one guitarist with two guitarists, Jack and uh, James. And that gave us even further like inspiration to try and find something a bit more stable in terms of style. Yeah. Which nowadays resulted in what will be in the upcoming EP. Excellent. So, Jack, like, what were you doing before you joined Hain, and what do you think? What influence did you think that you brought to Hain with this? Yeah, well, personally, Hain is actually my first music experience. I had never played with any other musicians before. I was still, you know, locked in my bedroom trying out new stuff. Yeah. And 
then I was contacted by Claudio and we decided to give a couple of rehearsals. Things went smoothly and, you know, it all started from there. Basically, I learned a lot from these guys as they all have very good experience within the local scene and also foreign gigs. So it's always a new learning experience. Yeah. So were you like a deathcore fan yourself beforehand or? No, I'm one of the main elitists. I just listen to deathcore and beat down and all these modern styles and that's it. <laughs> but he's, he's still young, so that's the only style he knows. <laughs> <laughs> I don't appreciate other styles. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all know that Chris is into glam metal anyway, so he's into his motley crew and all that. <laughs> <laughs> so excellent, guys. So um, even though Hayne are only a couple of years old then, for those that are new to the band, how would you say it compares to your early material? And do you think that you've found the sound that you've been looking for with EB? We kind of touched on that a wee bit. Um, do you think you're going to, with the newer stuff then, that you're just after saying... Um, has it progressed again or have you kept that same sound do you think have you added a wee bit more I think that the EP compared to the first four releases let's let's say it got a bit more on a heavier kind of sound and uh, it's a bit more rhythmical driven let's put it like that um, even yeah exactly exactly it's it's quite varied as in what the, the the tracks themselves they they portray different elements of our musical styles. Yeah. However, like the, the, that's also the main concept within the deathcore genre as well. You know that you incorporate a lot of different styles within that kind of one subgenre. Let's put it like that. Yeah. Um, uh, but yes, compared to the first four releases, I think now it's a much more focused and a much more organic way of writing the the new material. Yeah. And um, definitely it will be the direction on which we will keep on developing for even newer stuff. Would you even use the word mature? But I don't know if we could use that word mature with you three right enough. So, <laughs> like grown up. <laughs> so you also released a video for Burn It Down. So the video was shot in the studio. Was that always going to be the idea for the video? Or did you have other plans But for it with COVID then? And just basically that's all you could do? Well, yeah, for, for Burn It Down, it was always like the intention to have like a candid view of us playing in the studio, playing also at our practice space, yeah. goofing around, as you, <laughs> as you probably saw. Yeah. The, the so that was always the plan. So COVID didn't really affect Burn It Down as such, but it did affect our plans for the other videos that we were planning to do. Yeah. Uh, which are now sort of a small hiatus, I uh, think. Yeah, on hold for for the time being. So, uh, yeah. But burn it down was always that was always the plan. Yeah, you always looked as if uh, you enjoyed yourself in the video, especially Chris, a wee bit of the Joker within the band. But Conrad behind the kit, though, he was like, "Don't look at me. He's just complete yeah, he's focus. He's like a machine, you know. Um, he doesn't smile. He's just playing his instrument. Does what he needs to." <laughs> <laughs> But you guys looked as you guys looked as if you, you had a lot of fun in the studio, which is the way it should be. Yes, yes, and same same thing. Like you're saying, and like Chris was saying, um, the reason why we wanted it to be that way was also because I think it's the same for all of us. We enjoy being together in, in our practice space. We enjoy having those, you know, like regular one-off here and there mini arguments especially me and him <laughs> I but, to be honest with you uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure you do <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but even even for example we were blessed by the fact that even the pro uh, the producer dave he's a bandmate of mine in, an in another band and he's a very big acquaintance to the whole metal scene and yeah. we love the guy, we just love goofing around with him, having drinks with him and everything. So th that's one side. Even the guy that took the video for us, he's a super sweet, love hard person. Nick. Uh, Nick Bonello. And, no uh, relation, by the way. <laughs> I, was, I was actually going to ask that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we always knew that the band, the producer and, uh, and, and Nick would enjoy spending time together yeah. in the studio and in our practice space and everything. There's that good chemistry between everyone. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Enjoyable. Yeah. So it was, so it would have always been the scope of the video. Mm -hmm. 
So the, t- the, the producer Dave, yeah, did he like um, push you really hard? Like, did he push you to your limits? Um, did he actually bring any fresh ideas into the songs that you were doing? Actually, so like I said, I w- I play in another band with Dave, so I'm used to him and his way, the way he perceives the musical direction, even from a producer's point of view. Um, uh, but even for the rest of us, myself included, um, definitely, even just the fact that you have to come in like prepared, prepared you have to be more focused, even just the fact that we know this guy, we, we have to prove something, you know? Yeah. Even- also, also, Dave, uh, this is at least the way I went into it. Dave is a, a veteran and a legend in the local scene. So he's he's an amazing musician uh, at everything he does. Yeah. Uh, so at least I'm speaking for myself, but I'm sure the other guys are, are the same. When we went into the studio, we didn't want to kind of let him down by wasting time and, and not showing, showing that we're not prepared or anything. So I think everyone went in like really knowing their parts, yeah. um, ready to go. I was personally super anxious at first. It was yeah, my first, first time in the studio. So until I got settled in, so you get that was a very really next question I was going to ask. How did you find it, Joe, your first recording experience? I loved it. The first few hours I sort of had, you know, butterflies in my stomach, considering I didn't know what to expect. Yeah. But once I put it in, you know, laying down the first few rips, I'm sort of feel at home. Yeah. Nah, that's the point. He was grilled also from beforehand. I, I, I had been grilling him for the two <laughs> months prior to actually going to the studio. Like, <laughs> making it so much worse to start off. And then he eased <laughs> himself straight away, which I'll it's be worked, honest, it worked, it worked, worked out perfectly. That's excellent. Thanks a lot, guys. So Chris, with you being the vocalist for the band then, do you do the all the lyrics for the songs or do the other guys drop in things here and there? Are you quite welcome to contributions or? Yeah, um, so on this, on this EP, uh, I did the lyrics for all the songs, apart from Burn It Down, the single we, we just did. That was Claudio's um, work because he asked me if he could write the lyrics for that song because he had something particular in mind. And I said, yeah, why not? Yeah. And they worked out great. Um, yeah, but the rest uh, was kind of my responsibility. So the patterns um, we did together, me and Claudio, and, and in our practice space where we went down and I was just singing gibberish <laughs> as long as the patterns were there. Uh, and then we fit words to those to those patterns. But while we were working, Jack was sleeping next to us. Yes, most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting until after the video, you'll probably <laughs> punch them. <laughs> but it must be quite a headache for you guys though, that if, te- if Chris takes a bit of the responsibility to do the, the lyrics, then that must be quite a headache for you guys, because I know it's something that I definitely couldn't do, it's like write lyrics for a song, so uh, it might be a, quite a relief for, uh, for Chris to take all that responsibility. I saw him in the video with his phone, so is that what you do? Yeah. You write them down in your phone? Yeah, that's when I, when I would have got into the writing the lyrics not to drop yeah. But, yeah, but not having them memorized yet so yeah that part was just me trying to learn them <laughs> and you know go go along with the, with the lyrics but um yeah i i don't take i don't see it as like a, a headache to write lyrics there would be parts where i don't have any idea what I, i'm going to write next yeah. but what i do is usually i start off with a team to the song, what I wanted to write, write a particular song about. Um, what was helpful also was most of the songs already had names, kind of. Yeah. Um, so that kind of gave me a direction of where I want to go with the lyrics, what the topic will be, and what the theme will be, and uh, it kind of flows, especially when you have the the patterns already there laid down. It's easier to kind of fit in words within that yeah structure. So. Yeah, but there were times where I, I, I was stuck for a while, <laughs> or I, I had no ideas at all. And especially one of the songs, um, H7, we still call I still call it H7 with the code, with the code name. Come on, come on, what's H7? Uh, uh, hate Illuminate. <laughs> yes, I had no idea what I was going to write that about. And then one time I was coming back from the UK and I was in, in my, in the plane board and kind of inspiration came there and and yeah so but that was the hardest song for me to write 
lyric wise. That's excellent. Thanks very much, guys. So, um, was there anything that you guys had done differently between the recording of the EP to that of the previous singles? And maybe take the experience of the EP going forward? Uh, yes, yes, definitely. So before the first four singles, it was originally most of the work that we used to write uh, mostly where would have been me and our original guitarists. Yeah. And uh, then we would bump major structures over with Chris and Conrad and like tell them learn. <laughs> <laughs> um, so originally I wasn't. I wasn't exactly, guitarist. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, but then, but 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 then even um, so, let's say I for for this EP specifically, I took up most of the songwriting uh, responsibilities. Jack was helping me as well with the guitar parts. James was also involved, and then I was bouncing off ideas with Chris and uh, and Conrad. Yeah. Um. Uh, so we took a bit of a more organic approach. We were checking riffs out with each other, checking structures with each other, trying to find a bit of a bigger compromise in between, between the five of us. Um, luckily, I was blessed enough that most of the things didn't need a lot of fixing. So <laughs> that, that, that gives me a much that's where the smaller headache. That's where the arguments <laughs> come in. Yeah. <laughs> but, but we had to choose one of the... So we had six songs mm -hmm. originally, and we had to choose one to kind of eliminate from the recording process. And that was a hard thing. Yeah, that was yeah, a, yeah, that but that was, was really always hard. the scope as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That but was always the aim. We were kind of divided on that. Three of us wanted one of them to go. Uh, and, and Claudio and Jack in particular wanted that to stay. And it was really hard <laughs> right. to decide. Well, that's just raised two questions for me then. We'll start off with the easy one. With the EP then, how long did it take you to record to get everything done in the studio? Given you know with the COVID situation and all, let's just assume that COVID didn't happen. It was going to be a couple months project, but you know with COVID and all, we had sort of a small hiatus and sort of a five six months in total. Yeah, yeah. But in reality, if you take off, if you take away COVID, it would have been what a month and a half, two two months max. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Which raises the next question then: If you had six songs technically, then was there ever thought of just writing one or two more and releasing an album instead of an EP? I, no, I think no. we had discussed this before. The main scope <clears throat> of the EP was, you know, write a set of, track, set of tracks so we can showcase the different sort of roads we can take with, with each song. Yeah. And that way it would be more beneficial for us to stick to our style in the long run. Mm -hmm. And so when the full length comes, it will be even more defined into the style which we adapted from the EP. Excellent, thanks for that. No, because uh, in my interviews, uh, it comes up in the discussions quite a lot. Like um, people do like EPs, but then you get the fourth song and that's it, and you're just wanting more, um, and or five songs or whatever like that. And people say like, why don't you just do another two or three songs? So actually got an album and you've got a beginning, middle and end. But like yourselves, it's pretty much like an introduction to the world, to the world of Hain. So, yeah, I can completely understand why you've done the EP. Um, so, things seem to be fairly settled on the band members front with Hain. So, when constructing new material then, with the band members having their own personal taste in music, as we've discovered Chris is into glam, um, how do you say you keep it all together, for example, when negotiating what stays in and what goes out of a song? No, so, uh, so, like I was saying, um, I have these couple of hours during the day. So let's actually, let's rephrase. Let's start off differently. We aren't the kind of band that we meet in our practice space and we bounce off ideas during practice. We try and keep practice as focused as much as possible. We have the next couple of shows, so we'll practice in preparation for the shows. Yeah. I tend to suffer a lot from uh, having the 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. Uh, sporadic ideas. <laughs> so it would be me. Luckily now I live by myself in my own apartment, so I don't have to wake up my parents. <laughs> um, uh, so it would be me coming up with certain ideas. Um, Jack destroys my phone, sending me different riffs. 
Um, uh, but even then, for example, we start we start trying to agglomerate those ideas into a bit more of a structured idea, yeah. and we start putting the songs together. Maybe we try and do a different bridge. Maybe we try this riff. We do it with a different drum pattern or something like that. Um, so far, I mean, we I don't think we ever had any particular problems in terms of writing, uh, writing in terms of songwriting. As long as it works for us, that's the exactly, main exactly. beneficial point. But um, more than anything, I think we have found. So even me, for example, when I have these ideas or a riff with a certain drum pattern, which would be in mind, I would already start imagining the way Conrad would find it easier to play or something that would be more natural for him to do. And yep. even or else write riffs where I would know beforehand that Chris would come in as a vocalist uh, much better in those sections, which yeah. is also a bit of the style as well, given that deathcore is very rhythmical, it has a lot of those like stuck up of grooves, you know. Yeah, stuck. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, no, no, it's good that um, you just got a steady lineup and things like that, and wel welcome Jack into the team and stuff. So, um, it'll be interesting to see what he can bring, what extra stuff that he can he can bring. Will there be like a, a death metal influence or anything like that, or yeah, you, sort, of, sort of on that range? You know, it mainly depends what band I'm listening to at the moment. So mm -hmm. I sort of get you know highly influenced influenced at the moment. So if I'm listening to, for example, a brutal death metal band, I tend to lean towards one style. If I'm more on the gent or deathcore side of things, I tend to write more on the other side. Yeah, but, you know, as he mentioned, I sent him about hundred videos a week. <laughs> <Many more. laughs> There's a big short listing of riffs to go through. Yeah, you you must have a big uh, re recycle bin in your phone there, Claudio, and just for for them all to go in. <laughs> no, I'm sure Jack comes up with a good couple of riffs. <laughs> no, no, he's got, he's bringing about quite a a more mm. technical side, which we never or we just touched up on let's put it like that yeah um cons all, all considering considering his young age i mean he's the one that comes up with the most death metal sounding riffs and he so, said a few moments ago that he's not at all old school but he does bring <laughs> old school i do that without even realizing without even knowing <laughs> <laughs> no nothing wrong with old school death metal i'll tell you that now so Thanks for that. So, would you normally rehearse and record your song then? Where? Yeah, yeah. where do we rehearse? Uh, well, we have a practice space uh, that we share with three other bands. <laughs> with yeah. two other bands, sorry. Two, exactly. So, three in, in total. So, it's Hain, Fallen Icon, and and Repugnance, which is another band where Conrad plays, yeah. or yeah. used to play, because at the moment, Conrad is a bit unavailable with his <laughs> life situation, because, can we say it? Yes, yes. Uh, he had wins a year ago so his time is very very limited we share a practice space with three with two other bands and uh, we try and you know juggle time and we have a roster kind of when everyone yeah. is going to play now it's a bit easier honestly because as i said most of the bands are a bit on the down low at the moment and like you already mentioned most of our stuff is prepared at home so yeah. it comes to songwriting it's mainly, you know, everyone's on their laptop and we're bouncing ideas off each other, so there's no need for us yeah. to meet up and yeah. the right together. So either that or you guys come over to mine and, and we, we record. It's <laughs> the first time we stay here till one, half one in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you, guys. So there will, be, there will, of course, be no live shows uh, in the near future. So did you actually have plans for this summer? Actually, we had quite we, we were supposed to be having quite a busy year ahead um i think we and we, um, not we cancelled but they got cancelled we had like five, five local shows and, one, and foreign. one foreign show in italy and they were going we were going to be using those shows specifically even because it would have been a good staple to actually come out with the new material start yeah. testing the waters with the new material and actually start getting a bit of hype around the name. Yeah. Um, of course, like all the other bands, both nationally and internationally, this is, we all know what the situation is. We all know the limitations that there are. But yes, it was, it, it was very unlucky because it was going to be the year where we were all focused on actually 
putting Hayne even up even more there, you know? Yeah. Um, but at least looking on the positive side of things, it got us a bit more focused on actually doing the material that we have, on working out the logistics between ourselves. And like Chris mentioned earlier, uh, we, it actually got us a bit more, it gave us more time to actually start exploring new material beyond the EP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So with the downtime as well then, has it also made you focus on other areas of the band then, like the marketing side of things and the promotion side of things, rather than just songwriting? You're actually putting more effort into other things as well. Yeah, I mean, these two here are the gurus of that marketing side. I mean, <laughs> everyone pitches in a bit, but Jack, he's uh, like, Jack, Jack is, is, his nickname on, on our messenger is PR manager. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on our manager chat, group chat. So yeah, I mean, we're, we're trying new things also, um, trying a diff maybe different approaches, you could say, uh, to market ourselves. Yeah. We're being more using technology to our advance. Yeah, we're using obviously Instagram and Facebook and all that. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, and and also maybe an advantage of this current situation, the, the, the current COVID situation is that um, a lot of maybe big names that would usually have no time for a small band like us because they would be touring the world at the moment are sitting at home doing nothing, most of them, or doing things that they can do from home. Yeah. So, yeah, we can contact even big names that we wouldn't have even thought about before. That's it. That's exactly it. And just going back to what you said about the Italy show then, so how did that come about? Were you going to be uh, touring a big band or like supporting a big band or what was, the, uh, what was the gig going to be? No, it was actually a festival which was going to take place in Turin. Um, these guys, I think they came twice already. Walter? They've been, so basically it's <coughs> this relationship between uh, LM Productions, who, is, who are these Italian festival organizers, and Rejects here from Malta. Yeah. And a few years ago they built this sort of friendship and relationship where um, Rejects bring over Italian bands and LM Productions bring over Maltese bands. So, you know, there's sort of a small bridge in between the two countries. And we... Basically, the festival started off in Italy, and Leon and the rest of his team got even the festival name down to Malta. And when they were over in Malta, we had small, sort of a small discussion, yeah. and we reached an agreement that we would be one of the Maltese bands to go and play in their next edition of the festival. Oh, that would have been excellent. Is it just going to be is it a case of like all the plans for shows you had in 2020, you've just went copy, and in 2021, you went paste? So are you still invited for the festival next year? Up until now, that, that's the agreement, yes, that anything that was supposed to be happening in 2020 would go for 2021, at least some of the major local gigs that we were going to be having and this festival in Italy that we're saying. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so typically at least that, that was the arrangement that they would be postponed to next year. Yeah, that's excellent, thanks. And talking about touring again, like, um, and I've seen that you've played a handful of shows already. So before COVID, how hard has it been to like juggle the touring side of things with the everyday jobs? And you think you may go further afield in 2021 if the opportunity arose? Actually, we were discussing this recently, a, a couple of days ago. Yeah. Um, since now DAP will be coming out, we were actually like, you know, I think it would be quite normal that we try and plan things out and try and be aware of what possible situations we might want to look for in the future. Um, yes, so the idea is that of still we can't depend on uh, living off music for the time being. Let's put it like that. Let's yeah. hope not. Let's hope <laughs> that it wouldn't be the case that we can't. Um, uh, but yeah so so far we so far we are trying to set up a network let's put it like that as much as possible so that we can find opportunities where we can play abroad and bring the Hain name um overseas and even taking into consideration the limitations that we have in malta given that it's a small island we have to catch a plane every single time yeah so uh, so those kind of logistics do come into play and then of course 
most of us, uh, we all have full-time jobs still. So yeah, juggling between work and trying to find good arrangements for playing abroad, it's still quite a bit of a hassle. And even me personally, at least, I play with another band that we have quite regular shows um, abroad. So I know that, that it's difficult to actually try and find that work-life wow. balance situation. And Conrad has kids. Conrad has kids as well. So now, and so now it's even more of a, of a hassle for him. I'll just skip, skip school. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's excellent. Thank you very much for that. So, um, so you guys are prolific songwriters then with a number of releases under your belt already. So with the, with the, the EP just being recorded, what's next for him then? with the current situation i mean like we already discussed we can't do much we can't play live shows and whatnot so we're just focused on tracking down new ideas yeah Nothing set around, but we'll get a couple of jobs going around mm -hmm. so when the ball gets rolling again we'll have a good base on where we can start working again yeah and meantime we're pushing as much as possible so that the actual ep that will be released would be our first setting stone to actually try and market it as much as possible, try and attract attention from labels, PR agencies or whatever, which would be the first step into actually trying to take the name further abroad. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, Scotland will always welcome you and things. Um, but I hope you two can drink a wee bit more than Chris can. You know, he had like one can and he was like upside down behind the bar. You know what I mean? I think it's, it's um, quite easy to 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 pass Chris in this in this hey, area. Hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a shandy. It wasn't even a lager. It was a shandy. So I had lemonade. Oh, that's that's the shame, bro. The shame. It was actually a non-alcoholic beer. <laughs> We're gonna have to start looking for a new yeah. home, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know that we welcome you in in relation to the EP as well. Um, please send it to us. Uh, we'll definitely review it. We'll definitely promote it from our end. Um, I mean, we're multiple times and we're known all over the world and things like that. So we'll definitely do our bit to promote it and put it on uh, the um, all the social media sites. So we'll definitely do our bit. Cheers, man. Um, yeah, so I may be showing my age here. Um, but before the internet, magazines and fanzines were the places to find out about new bands and trends. And now publications have been replaced with thousands of websites catering for all genres. Do you think that some of the passion has been lost, or do you think that the internet has been a good thing for music and maybe a good thing for him? Um, I think that now it's a bit less organic and you have to consider a lot of algorithms which come into play. So you have to try and, you know, like you can't publish something at eight in the evening because it won't get the traction that it would get at midday when everyone is bored of his mind at work yeah. and would be rolling on his phone much more. Um, you also have to consider the markets a lot nowadays. The, the, oh, the, the variety which is present through the internet nowadays, it's more accessible for bands to actually promote their stuff. It's more accessible for bands to push as much as possible. However, it dilutes a bit the market there's in a way more in a way that there's so much competition and that there's yeah. so much availability for it that you'll have those three big bands which exactly. stand out and then there's a whole flooded market yeah. with very good music but it doesn't get the same attention as the other major bands. And yeah. another thing is also uh, through the internet, you know, nowadays most of us just see things through our phone. Back then... I'm, I haven't witnessed it so that much, but back then I know that there was a much more of a trading scene. You would, you would actually have to know the band. You would have to promote yep. the band than just if you're passing on cassettes or CDs or whatever. So there was actually a more of a link between the fan and the band and the fan and the one that would be pushing that kind of material. Yeah. Nowadays, it's so easy to just open up Spotify and find this band from God knows where. Yeah. Even though, having said that, to, to kind of build on what Claudio just said with regards to meeting people, our plan is, so we have physical copies of the CD, so our plan is, at least in Malta, obviously we can't do it abroad, but 
uh, our plan is if someone buys uh, a CD, Malta is small. So within 30 minutes, you'll be from one side to the other, basically. So we are going to meet people that actually go through the hassle of buying a physical copy and we go and meet them. Respecting maybe for regulations, wearing our mask and course, everything. Yeah, maybe taking, the, taking a selfie as an appreciation kind of thing. But we are going to try and keep that human element to it. So it's yeah, not just, it. uh, you know, selling uh, uh, over Spotify or, or, or over Bandcamp or whatever. I like that. I like what you just said. They're keeping the human element because I think it's just like you say, everything's just a click of a button now. It's for every time you go on to Spotify, you've got 10,000 bands doing the same things. But what maybe a wee advantage for you guys is um, you're the only Maltese deathcore band. So that might treat interest from A, B, and C countries, you know. So it might work for you. Um, and I wish you the best of luck. But I've known guys since like 1990. And it was like tape trading. So you'd put like a one pound note or one euro, we'll talk nowadays, a one euro, and we'll send it away. And you'll get a, a blank a setback and with a letter from the band, you know. So it was the excitement of waiting for the postman to come. But now it's just click, you know. So it's a, it's a double edged sword. It gets your name out there, but it can also try and find you amongst so many other bands, you know. But I wish you guys the best of luck. Um, Sorry, so I have to ask then, so Malta's a bit like Scotland, it's got a small yet, but a talented underground scene. So how easy or hard was it to find the musicians in Malta all wanting to play death, uh, Deathcore? And would you like to give a shout out to any of your bands in your scene? Well, this I will have to answer. Exactly. Um, so the way, the way Hain developed was, like, like I said, it was me and our, our original guitarist, that we both knew that we wanted to start a that core project or on those lines, let's put it like that. And I was already way before that in discussions with both Chris and Conrad that I would like to try out something on, on those lines with them. Yeah. So then when things aligned, it was like, it was perfect to actually go for it and try and push in that direction. Finding members in Malta, so that, far hasn't resulted headache. so far, but so far it hasn't resulted in that big of a difficulty not I mean, from our end but in in the general term by the way every way, musician in malta has two or three four bands yes so yeah, especially actually, actually finding a member who's willing and is able to, to commit he has the time to commit it's not the easiest thing yeah yeah, yeah so it's, uh, sorry carry on Claudio. Uh, but you asked as if we want to do a shout out to other yeah. bands. And stuff yeah. like that. So I think we would have to make a shout out to Fallen Icon. <laughs> <laughs> shout out to I mean, do you know, the Fallen Icon is, uh, they are a great band and stuff like that, but I don't really like the vocalist. Fucking vocalist. Every band he touches is, 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 is you know. No, uh, uh, Chris is a good vocalist and things like that. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm going to keep that for the next question then. So where would we find him on social media then? I already noticed that you've got like one and a half thousand um, likes on Facebook, for example. So there's clearly a lot of interest in the band already and you've not really released anything. Yes, the four singles, but this is your first re professional recording. So there's a lot of interest there already. So where would we find you on social media then? Yeah, so we're all on all the you know, big platforms. So we're on Facebook, um, YouTube, YouTube Instagram, Instagram, Spotify, Apple Music, Bandcamp, iTunes, yeah, Bandcamp. So, I mean, the, the, the young guy He's the PR manager, doesn't he? <laughs> he is. <laughs> yeah, practically that's right. King Music, you can. Yeah. Everything's up. Click up the, on the button. We're also getting ourselves into some Spotify playlists at the moment. So our songs can randomly come up, you know, as you're listening to this band on Shuffle Day and then maybe Hank comes up if we're lucky. But you know, it's all about get trying using everything using to, everything, yeah. everything yes. to your advantage. So if you go on our Facebook page, um, basically in the about section there are all the links to the other different um, social media platforms. Yes. So you can find everything over there. Excellent, thank you. And talking about Malta again, um, is there a good like metal scene like in terms of like there's a couple of rock clubs that you can go to and that's where the gigs are played and are the gigs well attended? Well, 
um, there is only one bar. We could say only one bar that is really a, r- dedicated to metal and, and, and rock. And yep. it's also geared for live show. So that was always the intention of this place. Um, but we do have some festivals here and there. We have also some big names coming over, like we had Kendall Corpse and... and uh, Christ, 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 and so we had a few big bands as well and, and a few good festivals that we can play in. Um, but yeah, the scene in Malta is obviously very small. We are a, a small population with an, a, a, you know, a proportionately, proportionately small so scene. Not all know, given that the scene in Malta is quite small, the quality in music is the amazing. The quality is... A, is, is so high. let's say yeah. we have... 60 bands in Malta, each band has their own element and it's of very high quality. Yeah. If you look at, for example, the band Cloud of Days in Abysmal Torment, yeah. they're one of Malta's pioneering bands. Because they, exports. They have well. very good reputation outside of Malta and even if you go to America, you know, a lot of death metal bands know who Abysmal Torment are. The same is with Beheaded on the death metal side and you have Forsaken on the Doom side. Yeah. There is a it's very good quality in the local scene. I'll need to do a wee bit more investigating then. Uh, so yeah. it sounds good to me. Certainly, this sounds good to me. But this is the real. This is really the question that you're going to talk a lot about now. So, Jack, what guitars did you use for the the recording of the EP then? Oh, so funny. <laughs> <laughs> have I started something here? Sorry. Um, <laughs> At the moment, I mainly use Jackson guitars. I have a Japanese built dinky and my baritone. But the thing is, the funny thing is, on my dinky, I have my custom vernacular in it, but it's sort of deteriorated a bit and it started microphoning um, the sound from the amplifier. And I had my baritone at home, so I ended up using Claudio's guitar in the studio, which is the same baritone as the one I have. But so it's he self- used the guitar, no, he used the basses guitar. It's his self-satisfaction <laughs> knowing that I used his guitar in the studio because I had issues with mine, which yeah. I didn't know beforehand. So your own guitar then is a, a six or a seven guitar string? I mainly use seven, seven, seven guitars seven. and I'm planning to also get a guitar built by a local luthier, Mani Karo. He also built... David De Pasquale's guitar, who does <clears throat> an exceptional job. Yeah. So seven seven strings then. So you're just shown off a wee bit then, or <laughs> what does a seven string? What does a seven string bring that this the six doesn't do? It gives you uh, Tuning, yeah. five extra notes basically because you have a lower string which is tuned to a lower note. Yeah. And it gives you sort of more stability on more the low stability. end and yeah. more variation, I think, because you have that low tuned. Um, low string while still having, for example, a standard tune guitar. Yeah. So there's more room for ideas. That's awesome. Claudio, for somebody so young, um, he certainly knows his stuff. You know, he's... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure. We, we, especially me and him, we have way too many gear conversations. I mean, even in my case, I'm quite proud to say that I've been using the Adding Wall for the past two years now yeah. which I had been looking for for quite some time and the even I'm very proud to hear the final mix of the uh, of the EP because of that bass sound that I was actually looking for specifically so yes me and him we have <laughs> one two three conversations <laughs> about gear that sometimes I'm over at his place for example and his family would be like Jesus fucking shut Christ, up, shut, shut up. <laughs> yeah, as soon as our age comes in, like, all right, what are we buying this month? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's excellent. I was actually a wee bit disappointed in your answer earlier because I was uh, like how you negotiate and how you contribute risks and things like that because I was expecting like blood on the walls and fisticuffs in the studio and things like that, but there's not any of that. So that's good. Really? No, we're a bunch of, we're a bunch of idiots who love each other. So... <laughs> I'm I'm genuinely saying it apart uh, apart from any kind of cliche and all that shit. Um, no, we actually just enjoy each other's company. We enjoy writing <clears throat> stuff with each other. So yeah. it would get very, very, very easy to actually bounce off ideas with one another. I think I saw in the video as well. It's a five-string bass you use, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. That's another show for Chris. 
Anyway, <laughs> so I have to ask you, Chris, uh, being the vocalist of the band, like, um, obviously, like, have you went through, like, a few microphones or anything like that before you finally settled on the one that you used for the EP, for example? No, not really. Um, I went there, found the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> You're not too fussy on gear. No, I'm not, I'm not at all fussy on gear, even when I play guitar with, with Fall and Ike. I mean, I, uh, I have an, a setup that I like, yep. and I've been using for a very long time and I, I I'm not very adventurous when it comes to changing stuff um, but yeah with regards to the microphone itself uh, I, I didn't have much say in that <laughs> I just went there and and whatever Dave our producer provided uh, I used and it came out I think it came out quite good quite good <laughs> could have been better but you know yeah that's that's always that's me <laughs> <laughs> fussy on gear. you're fussy on everything else yes yes on that's... everything else yes, except yes. for your own gear that's true <laughs> i'm fussy about the the most insignificant things to them but to me they would be important like a, a microsecond somewhere in the video that is not in sync or something like that that no one has seen apart from me <laughs> So uh, Jack's a PR manager, you're the OCD guy. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's about to be in order. Um, so see when it comes to like playing live shows then, uh, like um, Chris, how do you prepare for like doing a half hour, 40 minute set then when you're going to be pretty much growling into the microphone? How do you set yourself up for that? Yeah, so in the past I didn't do anything. I just went up on stage and started <clears throat> Streaming, <laughs> um, but lately I've been practicing more, so that's one thing. Because before I used to only do my singing whenever I, I went to the practice space or when I whenever we played live. Yeah. But now I'm doing more practice on my own as well, even in my car, just screaming like an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and before I go on stage, I do some warm up. Probably I'm not doing the enough <laughs> warm up because. I'm usually, you know, out socializing and trying to, to you know, talk to other people and, and stuff. Part of the PR as well. <laughs> or the excuse of the That's vocalist. That's always the excuse of the vocalist. Yeah, yeah. Not even carrying, after. Not, not even, carrying equipment. Even after. When, yeah, exactly. When you, you have to carry equipment, my excuse is always, I have to meet the people. And, you know, uh, you didn't. The, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I'm trying to be take care of my voice a bit more because even the style itself is a bit more intense, intensive on my voice than, for example, with Fallen Icon. Um, I noticed that because somebody for your size, sorry, somebody for your size, you've got some, <laughs> you've got some, <laughs> what you're going to say. <laughs> you've got some set of lungs on you. Um, you there was parts in the song, Burn It Down, and the video and things like that, you were, sh you were showing that you were going really, really deep into your lungs, you know. I'm just wondering, like, in the recording process, when you have to do it line by line, time after time after again, was it was your throat messed up for the next few days? Yeah, after? It does get tiring sometimes. I mean, there were one or two sessions where I was planning on doing, like, a song and a half or two songs, and by the, by the end of the first song, I had to stop because the voice is a bit of a different instrument than you know drums or guitar. Or, let it rest. <clears throat> if, it, if it decides that it, it's not going to work today, it just that's that's the way it is. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I was trying my best to give as much as possible, but there were there was a particular song I forgot which one, where I had to redo some lines another time when I was a bit you know. Yeah. more you know uh pre not prepared but my voice was a bit better so yeah. yeah i had to adapt yeah that's excellent guys i'll have to go back to claudio and jack again then because i know that they want to talk about the pedals that they use with their instruments then so give a give a quick mention about the pedals that you use then go for it actually in my case for my bass i i use just one distortion pedal which that's basically it. I use absolutely nothing else. Even live, it's just a booster and one distortion pedal. Um, uh, so it's the the Alpha Omicron. Um, uh, and my bass, especially my bass, with its uh, its EQing and everything, and that pedal specifically, 
it was the sound that I've been looking for for the past 10 years easy. Yeah. So nowadays, I'm very, very, very comfortable with my, uh, with my sounds. Even Dave, who I work with closely, um, uh, our producer, um, he knows precisely what kind of sound I want and everything. So it gets much easier. Um, it must have been some kind of feeling or emotion when you went, that's the sound I've been looking for. It must have been like... Yes, yes. No, I remember, I remember when I... Uh, so it was a two-step process. First step was the actual bass itself. Yeah. I, I just... adoring was I most probably wouldn't buy any other brand that, from this point onwards. Um, uh, so I remember when I bought it and it had arrived, I spent very, very easily. The first three weeks, I think I was practicing on it very easily, five, six hours a day. Wow. Just any given time, I would just, just go, go at it. Exactly, just to hear its actual natural sounding sound. Then I got the pedal, and it was even, once again, a re refresher of actually enjoying that whole thing. You ended up yeah. buying the pedal on your laptop also. Exactly, then I bought the, the same pedal for, as a, as a plug-in, as a VST, for, to actually record easier like that as well. So yeah, I'm quite refined and happy now at this point in time with my sound. Glad to hear it, glad to hear it. What about you, Jack? What do you... Um, I personally found my sort of sound very early on. I'm always, I've always been a big nerd when it comes to equipment, stuff like this. I run everything through an EVH 5153, which gives a nice body on the guitar. And while we're in the studio, I actually purchased the 1433, which is the Meshaga signature boost pedal. Yeah. And along with my burn, I can pick up just where it's one there is also. It gives a nice low end while still hearing that precise yeah. attack from the picking hand. That's it. Keeping it. But keeping it effective. Excellent. Listen, guys, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Um, Thank you. It's to, I've been been doing this since like the the beginning of August. So to get to to meet somebody, uh, well, to get to meet a band from like Motus is absolutely brilliant. Um, so I wish you guys all the best of luck with the the EP release. It would have been great if you could play like a an a, an EP release show, but obviously we can't at the moment. Did, have you ever thought of doing something in the studio, like playing the the EP in the in the studio or something like that, and streaming it or? We had to discuss it, but it's not yeah. sort of something we'll be interested in because, you know, we love the adrenaline that comes in with a live show, having people yeah. in the local scene right in front of you, getting a few drinks afterwards. I personally don't see it as being the same. Yeah, it's, it's beyond it's streaming it. And apart from that, even from my experience, at least, I've seen a lot of bands actually try to do it, and it's a good way how to actually engage with your own crowd. Yeah. However, smaller bands, which would have a smaller following, people tend to get distracted quite easily. So unless you're Metallica or whoever, it's, yeah. it's difficult to actually engage someone for a whole studio experience of 45 minutes. Yeah, yeah. No, I hear what you're saying, but... Thank you once again. We'll certainly do a bit to promote Hain because um, he certainly deserves to be promoted. So I wish you guys all the best of luck. Good to meet you. Thank you very Thank you. much. Right. Hopefully we'll get to meet in Scotland, in Scotland yep. after after all this stuff passes. Well, it's uh, your round, Chris. I don't know if you remember that. It's your round. It's your turn to buy them for a change. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>